Um, so I want to talk to you today about uh, wide area surveillance opportunities and challenges. And the reason I chose this talk is because generally when we talk about computer vision and understanding, we still have the model of the person being able to do a better job than the machine. And here is an area, and I, I'll show you, where you can't do it. It's very simple. It's you want all the information from the image, and if you give it to a person, there's no way they can do it. Okay? So that provides a very interesting challenge, uh, and at the same time, some nice opportunities. So um, let's start with uh, what it is. So we want to keep track of activity, and there are two breakthroughs that uh, occurs. One is uh, UAVs. And the other one is digital photography. So what you have now is this airborne systems that are getting images. Um, and it's called either WAS, uh, Wide Area Surveillance, or Wide Area Motion Imagery. OK? And just to give you an idea, so what we see here on this uh, footprint is what you get with a regular camera. Right here is a 640 by 480 image. This is what you get if you had HDTV. And here is the footprint you get currently with the wide area surveillance. So that kind of gives you the reason why we can't do it by looking at the picture, because uh, those are the pictures where you zoom in and you zoom in and you keep on zooming and more detail emerges. It's like the like in the movies, you know, like they see this blurry picture and suddenly someone pushes a button and, oh, it becomes clear and so, well, this is the same, but it's real. Right, the CSI movies where they always, they take the digital print and it's all blurry and then they say, okay, push this magic computer vision button and it becomes, uh, becomes clear and zoom in and you zoom in on the face and, oh yeah, of course, now I know who it is. Well, here you do get the information. Uh, so here, if I take this picture right here, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, so by the way, all the data that I'm showing you here is what is called the Cliff data set, which is the only public data set um, that's available for the research community. Most of the rest is unfortunately classified in every country. So uh, here is the image, so it looks uh, very nice. So what you can do here again is take a piece and zoom in and you can keep on uh, zooming. And <laughs> that's what happened. So you get more and more detail as you go. Okay? Uh, so that's your, uh, that's your imagery. Uh, and now, the other thing you need to realize is that this is taken from a moving observer. So this is really what the input to the system is. Okay? What you have is a, an aircraft that is ho hovering over an area and uh, giving you a huge pipe of pixels. So what do we do with this? All right, let's look at what we're getting. So the, the images I showed you are about 60 megapixels, which is small in terms of the, the, this type of imagery. The next resolution is coming about in a month or so. They will deploy the imager, and it's one gigapixel. So what's the difference, mega, giga, you know? It makes a big difference because suddenly you have to, just getting the data is a challenge. Just receiving the data because it comes at two frames per second. So you get one gigapixel twice a second, and in the coming months, it's going to be color 10 times a second. By the way, at 10 hertz and at one gigapixel, you can actually see the people. Everything I'm showing you, you don't see the people, you only see the vehicles. Okay? So great scale today. So uh, let, let's get into some of the detail, by the way. You can't make a camera that has the proper optics to do it. So the way they do it is an array of cameras that share somewhere here a focal center. 
so that you do not get any 3D effects. Uh, and here you have a, an array of CMOS, which is uh, regular stuff. Okay, so what do we do with these images? Uh, it's very useful for urban planning. Um, you could optimize, for example, the traffic pattern. You can change the lights accordingly. Certainly you can use it for security. You want to recognize suspicious movement. You want to recognize pattern of activity digital earth, and, and so on. I said early that we can't do it. Why can't we do it? The current paradigm is that you create an image, especially from a UAV, and you put it on the screen. So the goal of it is you may want to do some image processing to make it better and so on, but at the end of the day, the per there is a person looking at that image and deciding if it's a, a military scenario there are maybe five or six people and one decides to press the, the kill button or whatever. That's how, that's how it works. It's people doing it. Well, certainly you can't do it with this type of images or you would need an army of people, each one looking at a small piece of the image. And if you do that, you can't see some of the patterns. For example, you may have two cars that start at the same place and then are gonna diverge and then come back together. That's a very interesting pattern. Well, you can't see that by having an army of people looking at little squares. Okay. So, um, the goal here is to extract information from this data. And there are a number of steps from low level to uh, activity recognition. I'm gonna guide you through some of them. So the first one is mosaicing. Okay, so why do we need mosaicing? Uh, the reason we need mosaicing is because you have really different cameras. So here you have six different cameras, which are here, and you want to turn them into one camera. And so you need to correct for all the optical defects. And those are both static and dynamic. So certainly you could do a one-time calibration, but that's not enough because this thing is vibrating. So between every two frames, you're gonna have a slight misalignment. So you need to recorrect in order to get something like this. Okay? Uh, well, this is not new. I mean, there are many, many of these mosaic estimation processes, and also you can do photometric consistency. What we found is they're not good enough. They are not good enough because you still get some seams. So why are seams important is because if you're following a car on a road and suddenly the road breaks, then you have a problem with your tracker because your tracker has a discontinuity. So we're using a piecewise affine model. So we are modeling everything as a homography plus a additional transform, which is a, a, a lens distortion it's still not good enough, so we are creating here little patches, little triangles, and we are correcting them using a local affine transform. So if you look here at the result, uh, what I want you to see is here some of the errors that still occur if you're doing just a uh, lens distortion, and that's after our local correction. So it's very important to do the low level right, because otherwise you're buying problem for the high level part. So those are the mosaicing results. Um, notice that you still have a photometric consistency problem, which can be solved by uh, blending. And uh, here are two mosaics. That's at the beginning of the sequence and that's at the end of the sequence. So now basically we have taken a number of images and we know how to make them as if they were taken by a single camera. So what the next step is to stabilize the video. Because if we're gonna do motion detection, it's much easier to do it in stabilization. So what are the, the challenges? The challenges is that you have 3D. And I think we heard it in the previous talk, 3D is important and you can't ignore it here. 
So you need to stabilize with respect to the ground planes, but you have some really serious um, difficulties uh, in there. So what we do is we register to the reference frame after a set number of frames, and we change this reference frame. Um, uh, so we compute the optical flow to the reference frame, we estimate the homography, and we proceed. So uh, if we start from this image, we end up with this one. So notice that the buildings are moving. This is called the parallax effect. That's, uh, you can't stabilize unless you know the 3D in there. So we stabilize with respect to, to it. So uh, we're gonna see that you can treat it as noise or you can actually treat it as information. Okay. By the way, here is a close up of one of this stabilization. So here is what happens. So the buildings are moving very nicely together with the, the ants actually cars and trucks. So uh, again, let me play it again because I want you to see the goal is to detect every car, track it, say whether it's a car or a truck, and follow them. Now, we're going to have problems when they go behind the buildings, of course, or when they stop and turn and do all kind of uh, interesting things. Okay, so let's talk about tracking now. Now we have stabilized images. How are we going to do the tracking? Well, the tracking is, um, is really what's telling you what's going on in the scene. The challenge is, is cars are about 5, 10 pixels. And there are lots of them. Think of looking at a city the size of San Diego, for example. You can look at it for 24 hours. And over 24 hours, you can find out where everybody's going to work, where they start, where they're going what they're doing the whole, the whole way, accidents and so on, uh, you have to keep track of a very large number of targets to do this. It's a very classical problem. The most famous uh, algorithm is the MHT, multiple hypothesis tracking, uh, or the JPDAF. There have been a number of recent results using uh, MCMC sampling and recently divide and conquer. Uh, we have tried all of them. Um, they work quite well, but they don't necessarily scale up to this type of uh, images. So it begs for a, an efficient technique. And the way we do it is by looking at a window, which is about four to eight seconds, depending on the, on the frame rate. And what we do is we find tracklets, which are short tracks in each frame, then we associate them in the next frame. Then we create new tracks for whatever we have not explained, and then we move our window by one. So we do reasoning in this window. Okay. We make no assumption on the number of objects. For each detection, we create a detection tree, uh, which is a set of possible association, and this approach Prevent, avoids us the enumeration of all the hypotheses. So here is an example of two adjacent frames, T and T plus one. What we have is a directed acyclic graph that represents the first detection. So in this frame, we have a detection. Then we look at the neighbors and we put there all the possible connections. Then we do this, and then we follow this directed acyclic graph, which is not a tree, and solve a problem, which is going to be an optimization problem in the whole window. So we do it using uh, Bayesian statistics, uh, and I'm going to skip the math, but basically we factorize this joint distribution according to the uh, detection. And uh, we're using a linear Gaussian motion uh, model. And we're using some kind of appearance. But appearance in this case is fairly simple. It's dark or light. Because we can't really tell one car from the next. And the solution is given by a max product 
uh, in there. Okay. Uh, the generate all possible tracklets, then uh, that only from the valid detection, which reduces the number quite a bit, uh, and we merge, merge the tracklets similar in appearance and motion. Okay. Uh, nice properties of this is that occlusion are handled as long as they do not span a larger extent than the window, that, the processing window. Okay. Uh, whenever we have missing detection, we add virtual detection to the, to the DAG, and it's a recursive procedure. So here are some examples of results. By the way, one of the difficulties in working with this is getting ground truth and deciding whether you're right or wrong. Okay, so we have an army of undergrads that are spending their time clicking on these images in there, and only small windows, of course. Okay, uh, we get some very good uh, rates, uh, which is about 72% object detection rate and a very low false alarm rate. We have compared with a number of other techniques, um, and our false alarm rate is much lower uh, than the other. We tried our own MCMC tracker, and it just doesn't, doesn't scale up uh, to this type of, uh, of problem. Uh, the efficiency, of course, depends on the number of detections. The parameters are the sliding window scale and the model. The current limitation is that long occlusion, so if you go more than uh, eight seconds, then we do not reconnect. And stopped cars at this point are a problem because they become part of the background, but we are working on it. Okay. So... Um, I said that 3D can be either a considered noise or signal. So if we are looking at here at this image, look what happens. The car, as the building moves over the road, our cars disappear. So you could say, well, you know, it's too bad. But in fact, if we know the 3D, then we can project a mask onto it and say we have an occlusion here and therefore I can try to re reconnect these two. And this is a CVPR uh, 11 paper. Um, so here is the idea. The idea is we have the GPS data and the inertial navigation. We have a reference image. What we can do is can bring some 3D models, get the camera pose in geo coordinates, create an occlusion map, and then track the moving objects, get the tracks, find the sources and sinks, and then perform the recognition. So the first part, how do we get the occlusion map? It's important to realize the occlusion map itself is dynamic because the, the object is moving. So here is an example of the occlusion map. Given the building model, we can project that occlusion map and, and use it. So um, we need to get the camera pose in, and the models. So the models in this first phase we are using, um, we can use a database of models. We can use a GPS and IMU and then register the video imagery to the reference image. Uh, and that gives us about 10 pixel error, which is good enough. As I said, we can create the models manually or we can get it from a, a very nice uh, Google 3D warehouse. And then we need to find the sources and the sinks. So what do they look like? Sources and sinks are places where all tracks stop. And then that's a, that's a sink, and then a source is a place where a lot of tracks originate. Okay. So we look at this by doing a clustering in a x, y, v, v, x, v, y space. And then we need to establish correspondences between sources and sinks. 
At this moment, we only do binary <coughs> correspondence, which we assume there are no corners being, uh, there are no intersection being occluded. Okay? Uh, now that we have our sources in sync, we can perform alignment. So here is the illustration. You have three cars that come in and three cars that come out. You might know that the one is red and two are green, so for the red one, it's easy. For the green one, they may have switched. So if you're using the Hungarian algorithm, for example, to do so, it doesn't care about order. So you're gonna get all kind of wrong answers. So instead here, what we are using is a dynamic programming solution where we are matching pairs of tracks and we have a cost for a gap. And if you compare it to the Hungarian algorithm, we get a much better uh, result with many, many uh, fewer incorrectly linked tracks. So here are examples. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples here of this car disappearing, but it is still being tracked and, and reappearing on the other side. Uh, here is another example with more. So this is showing you that we are basically imagining the trajectory between, between these. And here. Well, I said that we needed to get the 3D, but what if I have never seen this scene before? What if I have, uh, so I need to infer it. So to do it, I need to do 3D reconstruction. Uh, 3D reconstruction is difficult because buildings are complex. And if you just run your average stereo, you're gonna get buildings that have slanted uh, walls. So uh, that doesn't work. So here is a way we do it. We're gonna compute a dense disparity map, then we're gonna use the information that lines are either horizontal or vertical as a heuristic. Again, it's not a, it is not a, a constraint, it is a heuristic that we're gonna build into it. Then uh, we're gonna use a two-pass dynamic approach to do it. So two-pass dynamic approach, the first pass is we're gonna do dynamic programming, but instead of doing it along the epipolar lines, we're gonna do it along the extracted lines. So we are enforcing continuity of, uh, along the, 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 uh, the extracted line. And the second one, we're maximizing a normal, uh, a normal metric. Okay. So this is extremely fast. On a thousand by thousand image, uh, it takes about 71 seconds to build an entire 3D map. And then if we want the modeling, that's a different story, but getting the 3D is extremely fast using the GPU because uh, it is very simple. So let me show you some results here of the scene. And what I would like you to look at is the quality of the walls and the buildings in this case. Here, Uh, here's one building, and again, it doesn't have to be the face, so the face are really vertical. And here is a one building in particular. If we zoom in on this building, here is the 3D we are able to get out of it. So very, very accurate. And this is done with only three images. Uh, this is a road that is higher than the rest, and we do get the trees. So it is not because we are enforcing the, we are enforcing the 3D uh, of the buildings, we also get the non-3D parts. Let me skip this. Uh, we did it also, of course, on the cliff data set. And okay, so 3D reconstruction uh, is part of it if we don't have models. Now let's move to the meat of it, which is really what we want. All we did so far was just a feeder for this uh, last part, which is the activity recognition. So um, what are activities here? 
we have a somewhat simpler problem because effectively we are looking at a 2D uh, world. Things are moving on the road, uh, but we have multi-actor activities. Some of these activities are hierarchical. For example, you can track a car and do a three-point turn that can be decomposed. Uh, you have sequence of events. You have composition of activities. You have many too many relationships between track and activities. And some of them have strong, uh, short or long time scale. For example, speeding. Speeding on a road is a very short term activity. Meeting can be a very long term activity or a drop off. Two cars, one car waits, the other one comes, they stay together for a while, and then they go in different direction. That's a very interesting activity. So there are many, many approaches. We are using the fact that it's effectively 2D, that we have an enormous amount of context. What is our context? We have the absolute time, and we have the absolute locations. So that makes for our, a problem to be much easier, but we have no training data. Okay. If you wait for examples of uh, accidents, for example, well, you're going to wait a long time, and then every accident is actually quite different. So here is the way we do it. We use something called entity relationship model. And you might be more familiar with entity relationship models in financial data or uh, things like that. But that's what it is. It's database management system. So we look at it from a database management system point of view. What we have is video produces tracking plus georeferencing. We have a geographical information system. Our input from the tracking gives us attributed tracklets. We put them into our ERM representation and we present activity as a query, an SQL query. Then we have an engine, which is an SQL search engine that gives us our activities. Okay. So tracks as the essential components. We're going to break the tracks not into complex tracks, but into tracklets. What is a tracklet? Is a linear piece of the track for which the speed is about constant and the direction is straight. Okay? So if you have a track like this, we're going to break it into tracklets. Okay. Um, we break it and we have a limit on the length of the tracklet. So even if you have a very long straight line, we're going to break it into uh, pieces. So what is a, an activity now? It is nothing but something like that. What we have is entities such as Traffic rules, road buildings, areas. We have relationship on the road. Road as traffic rule. Must stop is a traffic rule. And so it's a very nice grammar. And then an event can be represented by just a relationship. Okay. So here is an example of uh, the templates that we are using. An activity is a set of tracklets which obeys of conditions with a certain con confidence greater than a threshold. So that's what an activity is in our uh, world. So speeding is the set of tracklets for which it is on a certain road and the speed of this object is greater than the allowed speed on the road. So Look at the different type of activity that we can do. We can have simple ones. So simple ones are independent of the context. A U-turn, a loop, a two-point turn, or a stay. Those are context-free. Geospatial are being on road X, X being whichever road you want, speeding, stop violation, traveling point A to point B, where A and B are absolute. Uh, multiple actors, sources, sinks, following, creating a convoy. Those are activities that are multiple actors. And then we have uh, composite, composite ones, which are compositions of elementary activities. 
So here is an example of a loop. So what you see here is this car comes here, does a three-point turn, goes back, and goes here. So there is a segment, which is a loop in here, which we detect. And here is the SQL uh, statement. Another one is a source. So we define a source as two cars coming and disappearing together. And then you say that the source is a confluence of such two cars happening. Geospatial activity being on road X, that's the very simple one. Um, we did some preliminary uh, validation that we are able to get the loops, the three-point turn, and so on, and we get very nice results. Uh, here is, those are, we can work, by the way, not just with visual tracks, but with GPS tracks. Because now, GPS tracks uh, have the same structure. So here are all the loops. How did we get these loops? Same thing, the same undergraduate students, when they are done labeling the cars, we put them with the GPS, and we have them run around campus doing stupid things, and then we uh, detect it and verify that we actually detect it. Okay. Um, we did get some data, which interestingly, the data itself is classified, but the tracks are not. So we got the tracks, and we had seven hours. So we got a seven hour chunk of data and uh, creating 50,000 entries in a database, and all they wanted was coordinated movement, brush pass, and dead drop. So let me show you what we get. So here I have um, an example of uh, coordinated arrival. So here, there's two cars. They started differently, but they're gonna stop at they suddenly merge and follow each other. So this is a coordinated arrival. Here is a brush pass, correctly detected. So again, you have one car that's standing there waiting and then the other car comes stop and then they both leave together okay this is real data this is where little triangles is just for illustration this is real data and the result is also uh, from our system another example of brush pass two cars turn and we define it as brush pass you can also call it meeting so uh, this is very very efficient by the way it takes about uh, two minutes for one query uh, on a on a very very large uh, data set with seven hours uh, the current limitation is that we have confidence but we don't have really probabilistic framework for it uh, i've given you kind of a vertical of this problem where you start with a different type of data uh, we have practical solution for the low level we have shown you how we can do tracking of many small targets uh, we can do 3d reconstruction uh, we can do activity recognition uh, obviously there is a lot more a lot more work uh, to be done in there. In particular, fragmented track are a source of problem. 3D reconstruction is by no means solved. And this notion of uncertainty in track attribute and geospatial data is a uh, fairly open problem. Thank you.